Greetings, ladies of the suffrage movement and guests of Seneca Falls. And congratulations and a warm welcome on this anniversary of the suffrage movement in Seneca Falls, the first woman's conference held there in 1848. Also to uh, the National Park Service, who keeps the history uh, in Seneca Falls and across the country. Thank you for inviting me to talk today on this uh, peculiar topic of uh, speaking on the writers and orators of universal suffrage. Uh, you might uh, guess my surroundings here uh, are quite handsome, uh, quite lovely as a matter of fact. Uh, I am uh, sitting in the home of Mr. Uh, Mr. Riddick. Uh, and behind me are the dresses worn by his wife, Anna Marie Riddick. Uh, she was a, a very well-dressed woman. Uh, and uh, these are some of the dresses she wore in her time. She, as a matter of fact, was the founder of the Might Movement here uh, in Suffolk, Virginia, and uh, was the first woman to vote in the city of Suffolk, Virginia. So I feel quite comfortable uh, in my surroundings. Of course, I would rather be in Seneca Falls. Nevertheless, I am uh, coming to you to talk to you on this topic of the writers of uh, the suffrage movement and the abolition uh, of slavery. Uh, and uh, I thought what I would do in structuring my comments, arranging my comments, was to take a few pages out of my third narrative, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, in which I actually gave credit to, to, to many of the women of the uh, suffrage and abolitionist movement uh, and some of the reasons that I thought that they were great people, uh, as well as the men uh, of that era as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll be giving you a little bit of information about uh, some of those who uh, together uh, with myself worked uh, for universal suffrage the suffrage of women, and the abolition of slavery. Now, key to this, of course, was the fact that uh, all of us, most of us, uh, had to overcome some obstacles uh, in order to uh, give ourselves an education that would be worthy to uh, climb the ladder of uh, what you might call a great writer and orator. Uh, even the women, uh, uh, Mrs. Lucretia Mott, um, Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, so many of the women of that era uh, had to overcome obstacles in order to uh, be able to come get their education and, and become great writers. Uh, they were restricted as far as what they could do. Their expectations were low, or were set low. Uh, and so they, like myself, and you'll certainly hear later about my narrative, of overcoming obstacles uh, just to exercise uh, their intellect and their talent. Now, uh, when I left Lynn, Massachusetts uh, with my children and my wife, and I came to Rochester, New York, uh, this is where I started meeting uh, many of the women of the suffrage movement. Uh, I had already uh, heard their reputations as, as great orators, as great, as great writers, uh, and uh, it was certainly a privilege to be sitting at the table with these women, uh, talking about the issues of the day. I had already read uh, some of their letters and some of their commentaries in the newspapers. And so I was there in Rochester to establish my own newspaper. And uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, set up shop uh, in, in Rochester and right across the street uh, was uh, the uh, father and brother of Susan B. Anthony. And so we struck up a friendship and, and that is how I was uh, eventually introduced to Susan B. Anthony. But let us not forget these women who uh, established this first uh, woman's suffrage conference in Seneca Falls. Hinging on the document that they drafted at the time, uh, the Declaration of Sentiments. Now the key author of this uh, Declaration of Sentiments was Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and of course, she was a, certainly a great writer and thinker. 
As a matter of fact, if she had been born a man, which I'm sure, and she confided this in me, uh, that she uh, was born uh, uh, to her father's dismay, a woman. He certainly would, would have rather had a, a, a man, uh, a son, uh, who could follow in his footsteps in the, in the uh, career of lawyering. And so, nevertheless, she endeavored to learn the trade and became uh, a great writer and certainly knew how to uh, create an argument that would capture the minds and the imaginations of people uh, and bring them to the movement. And she had already been speaking across, across the country and uh, now uh, they felt like it was time. They met uh, with uh, Mrs. McClintock in Waterloo and uh, they uh, sat down at her table and drafted what we now know as the Declaration of Sentiments. Now this was a, a parody or a, a contrast uh, to our Declaration of Independence, which uh, let us know uh, line by line, case by case, uh, what, uh, what, how the women were disenfranchised in America, that they had privileges but no rights. And so they were demanding their rights as as citizens of the United States of America, guaranteed by the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And uh, so they drafted this document and in quick order uh, decided to have a woman's suffrage conference in, in uh, Seneca Falls. And so they arranged to have that at the Wesleyan Chapel. They sent a telegram to me up in Rochester uh, and they were very eager to get this thing started. Within a, within a couple of days, they were having uh, the, uh, the conference, and I hardly had time to put an announcement in my newspaper. Uh, I, I did uh, get the invitation to be uh, the master of ceremony uh, on that Sunday uh, as they uh, took the vote for those signatures uh, of those people supporting the Declaration of Sentiments. And so the Declaration of Sentiments was read, to the audience of hundreds of people and uh, those who uh, gave their consent signed the Declaration of Sentiments. I was one of 32 men and the only black man to sign the document. And it went on from there uh, to uh, other conventions in Syracuse and uh, in Auburn and Rochester uh, where people signed the document, read the document and signed it. And then beyond the borders of New York uh, that this uh, movement would start uh, its migration across the, across the country. And so, uh, if you have the opportunity, and please do, read the Declaration of Sentiments. Imagine uh, um, the uh, intellect that it took, the reasoning that it took. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Stanton and, and those who helped her draft the document uh, to make a good case uh, for the suffrage of women, uh, many women of the time, uh, including uh, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, because, of course, literature was a great part of uh, this uh, wide range of art forms uh, that were persuading people to consider the plight of those people disenfranchised and and in bondage in, in this United States of America. And so uh, uh, that uh, document, that book that she wrote, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, caught fire. And uh, certainly it was right, widely acclaimed and widely ridiculed uh, by those Southerners who did not want this narrative to be told. I remember around uh, 1852. This is now I am getting my footing as being a writer and and uh, right around the time I gave my uh, speech that you might recall, uh, what to the slave, uh, what to the American slave is the 4th of July. Other women of the movement as well were absolutely wonderful writers, including uh, the, the Negro women, the colored women. Uh, you see, uh, the woman, the black woman, had two uh, weights to carry. Not only that of sex, but that of race. My wife, uh, Anna Mary, and my daughter, uh, uh, both had to carry two weights, that of sex and that of color. 
And that is the reason that I started uh, uh, my, the mantra of my newspaper, right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we're all brethren. And so uh, those women, the colored women of our time, uh, had to climb uh, an even steeper hill uh, to put themselves in a position where they could express themselves and express uh, their, uh, their disenfranchisement. And uh, some of the best were, of course, uh, one that was frequently on the road with me, uh, Frances E.W. Harper. She was a wonderful poet, an outstanding orator, and I can recall hearing her speak uh, uh, many times, sitting in the audience and listening to her great oratory skills. Uh, but I'm certainly partial to, uh, to poetry. Poetry is one of the first things I started studying uh, when I was uh, learning to read and write. And one of my favorite poems by Francis E.W. Harper, I might share it with you now. Uh, it's called, Bury Me in a Free Land. Make me a grave wherever you will, on a lowly plain or a lofty hill. Make it among earth's humblest graves but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest if above my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gang to the shambles led, or a mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash, drinking her blood with each fearful gash. If I saw young babes torn from her breasts, like trembling doves from the parent nest, I'd shudder and start if I heard the bay of the bloodhounds seizing their human prey. If I heard the captive plead in vain as they bound afresh his galling chain. If I heard young girls from their mother's arms, bought it and sold for their youthful charms. My eye would flash a mournful flame, my death pale cheek red with shame. I would sleep, dear friends, where bloated might could rob no man of his dearful right. My rest would be calm in any grave where none could call his brother a slave. I ask no monument, proud and high, to capture the gaze of a passerby. All that my yearning spirit craves is to bury me not in the land of slaves. So you see, these poems, these songs, these speeches and letters written during the suffrage movement, during the time of universal suffrage, our fight for universal suffrage, were inspiring uh, documents. Uh, that should be read and reread again. Um, even later in my life, uh, and I continued even after uh, the suffrage movement had waned, uh, to continue to work uh, with uh, women uh, in this fight. I remember as late as uh, 18, uh, 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair uh, that I teamed up with Ida B. Wells. We were quite upset that at this world fair or world platform uh, that they would regulate, uh, relegate uh, the colored man to uh, second-class citizens. And so we, we drafted a document, uh, a pamphlet that, that we uh, tried to get distributed widely and republished in papers and, and such. Uh, it was titled, uh, uh, Why the Colored American is Not uh, in the World uh, Colonial Fair. And we uh, co-authored this document along with her friend at the time who would become her husband. Uh, and uh, we made great use of this document. I also gave a speech uh, at the Chicago World's Fair uh, about uh, the situation in Haiti, our friends in Haiti, uh, the speech on Haiti. And so you see how uh, literature, how uh, letters, how commentary, uh, were used to capture the imagination of those people who uh, heretofore had not supported women in their, 
and their suffrage for equal rights and the right to vote. Now, of course, uh, uh, my narrative is, uh, is a steep climb as well. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, restricted in numerous ways from getting to the lofty heights that uh, my, my history and what history tells of me, uh, the reputation that I have as a great writer and orator. I was born, of course, around the year 1818, uh, the slave masters did not want slaves to have any knowledge whatsoever. An educated slave is a worthless slave, and so I didn't even know the exact date of my birth. The closest I could come would be planting time or harvest time, cherry time. And uh, certainly I was not permitted to go to school or learn how to read and write, but it was certainly uh, the divine intervention that covered my life that at eight years old I was sent to Baltimore to live with my master's cousins, Mr. Hugh and Sophia All. Now, Mrs. All uh, would risk her reputation to teach me a few words, a few letters, uh, alphabet, uh, and words from the Bible, the newspaper. And once I had a few words to describe my misery as a slave, my mind became free, and thus my body had to follow. You know, you cannot enslave a freed mind. Once your mind is free, your body has to follow. And so I would, uh, on every occasion I got, uh, try to uh, learn a new letter, a new word. I would uh, copy uh, notes uh, from uh, young Master Thomas's uh, notebook and scribble it on my piece of paper. Uh, as I was walking to school, back and forth with the boys, I would take the few letters that I knew, did know how to, to write, uh, and uh, I would wager the boys that if I could make a W, they would show me how to make another letter in the alphabet that I didn't know. I would stoop right down in the sand, draw a W, and they would have to show me how to make a Q. Can you imagine uh, having to steal every letter uh, you ever learned uh, in the alphabet? That was me. Of course, uh, uh, as the master said, an educated slave is a worthless slave, and I became quite unruly. They sent me back to uh, to Maryland on the eastern shore. They tried to break my spirit, uh, and when that didn't work, uh, well, they sent me back to Baltimore. I stayed in Baltimore until I was around 18 years old. I worked in the shipyards, and uh, while doing that, I was still learning how to read and write. Uh, as a matter of fact, I purchased this book uh, right here. It's called The Columbian Orator. Now, this was a school book of the times, and it's full of great speeches and poems, all the great writers of the early centuries, as a matter of fact, up until uh, that time. Even Cicero and, uh, and Plato, and not only speeches in here, but uh, also other, uh, well, instruction on gestures to give as an orator, uh, tone and inflection of the voice, and so this was my uh, school book, my first school book to teach me how to become a writer and a great orator. As a matter of fact, one of, one of my great passages from here is some instruction from Cicero on uh, the gestures to be given uh, while you are uh, giving a speech. It says here, and he who claps his hand to his sword throws us into a greater panic than he who only threatens to kill us. <laughs> well, I certainly took that to note. Uh, when I was giving speeches, I, I certainly had to be brave because those uh, in the audience sometimes did not want me to have a speech. And they would uh, certainly throw things at me, uh, potatoes, rocks. Uh, I was, it was certainly a risk uh, to stand up and speak uh, for the abolition of slavery and for the suffrage of women. Now, uh, I took this book and, and did the best I could with it, and I started to purchase other books. By the time I became an, an older man, I had actually 5,000 books in my library. Well, I was certainly admiring all the other writers of the time, the men who were great writers, uh, uh, Whitman, uh, Whittier, the great, uh, uh, the great poet, uh, and uh, so many of them wrote so many uh, things uh, that supported uh, and took a stand. They took a stand uh, with, their, with their literary writings. 
that uh, slavery uh, was an abominable institution and that women deserved their rights. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, other poets that I, I really admired uh, was Herman Melville. Now, Herman Melville, uh, as you might know, uh, wrote many poems, but one of my favorite poems of his is that he, uh, well, before I get to that, I, did, I certainly wanted to share with you. Now, this is the very, I'm partial to poetry, as you can tell. The very first poem that I learned how to recite from this very book, The Columbian Origin. And I also uh, taught others, as I was teaching in Sabbath school, other Negroes who did not know how to read and write. I would use a Bible and I would use this document as well. And I would teach them how to recite this poem as well. Uh, it does not have a title, but it says here, you scarce expect one of my age to speak in public on the stage. And if I chance to fall below, that's Mosthenes or Cicero. Don't view me with the critic's eye, but pass my imperfections by. Large streams from little fountains flow, tall oaks and little acorns grow. And though I now am young and small, of judgment weak and feeble tongue, yet all great learned men like me once learn to read their ABC. Now, reciting that over and over again, I quickly developed uh, uh, some skills as an orator. Uh, but getting back to uh, Herman Melville, uh, my favorite point of, of his uh, uh, gives tribute uh, to another of my favorite abolitionists, John Brown. Of course, you know the story of John Brown, uh, who took 21 men down to Harper's Ferry uh, and attempted to take, uh, take that fortress, uh, was captured and then executed. Well, uh, uh, Herman Melville, uh, in witnessing the execution of John Brown, uh, wrote a poem, and it's what is remarkable about this poem and many of the other writers of our time, is their ability to articulate uh, and give imagery uh, to uh, what other people could not witness. And so uh, this would be his poem called The Portent, which uh, describes the execution of John Brown. Hanging from the beam, slowly swaying, such the law, Gaunt the shadow on your green, Shenandoah. The cut is on the crown, low John Brown, and the stab shall heal no more. Hidden in the cap is the anguish none can draw. So your future veils its face, Shenandoah. But the streaming beard is shown, weird John Brown, meteor of the war. Well, in this poem, Herman Melville makes a prediction that actually comes true. The Civil War will be ignited with the first shots of, at Fort Sumter. And uh, uh, our emancipation wouldn't be not too long. Well, after some suffering, after some uh, casualties, 800,000 uh, Americans killed fighting one another over this institution of slavery. And thanks to uh, another great writer of our time, one of the greatest, uh, certainly his skills uh, of learning how to read and write and, and laboring over uh, campfires and, and logs and candlelight, to learn how to read and write and, and make an argument helped him write uh, the Emancipation Proclamation gave him the ability to reason and strike a balance that would uh, actually save the Union and stand the test of time for this uh, thing we call a democracy. And so, of course, Abraham Lincoln would be in that uh, pantheon of great writers of the 19th century that uh, we would give tribute to. Uh, and, of course, I gave so many speeches during those years before the Civil War, my speech on uh, Dred Scott over the decision uh, 
uh, of Judge Tommy. Uh, Self-made men. Uh, my speech uh, to Maryland, a friendly word to Maryland. Uh, so many speeches that I gave all around uh, the country uh, that I took labored to make sure that I was um, making a statement, making an, a case uh, that the black man would be fully enfranchised in American society. I ended up writing uh, uh, two other narratives, a narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, of course, the first, My Bondage and My Freedom, and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. You might not know, uh, of course, uh, that uh, I actually uh, tried my hand at a little uh, historical fiction. <laughs> I wrote a, a novella. Of course, uh, historical fiction doesn't go quite as well as the true facts of history. And so uh, the novella did not do quite as well as, as my narratives. But I certainly had to um, uh, take in consideration, especially with uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, that having the audacity to write a document like narrative of the life, or having the audacity to write a document like the Declaration of Sentiments would bring you some scorn uh, from, from those uh, who did not have the same idea of a more perfect union. When uh, we had uh, the signatures in Seneca Falls, some of those people were harassed and molested so much that they had to take back their signatures. Their, their businesses were, were harassed uh, and uh, they took back their signatures. Uh, I, after writing uh, the uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, the bounty on my head, because I was not a free man at that time, I was running, uh, but still speaking on behalf, I was in Massachusetts speaking on behalf of the anti-slavery uh, uh, society, and uh, the bounty on my head went up con considerably. Uh, threats uh, for my capture uh, and my execution even, so much so that uh, Mr. Garrison and some of the others uh, decided that it would be prudent that I would leave the country. And so they put me on the ship, the RMS Cumbria, and I ended up spending 21 months in Ireland and England. Uh, fortunately, in that situation, I came back a free man. They negotiated for my freedom as Julia Griffiths and the Richardson family. And so I came back to America uh, to continue uh, my agitation uh, for my fellow men and women in bondage. And so it is uh, certainly something to be said about the great writers uh, of uh, the suffrage movement and those of the abolitionist movement. If they had not been writing the letters and commentaries, not only to the black press, the North Star newspaper, but other press uh, newspapers across the country, then word of this struggle would not have taken hold. Uh, the imagination and hearts and minds of people would not have been changed that they would stand up and fight for their, their fellow men and women. And so it's certainly important that uh, we continue and that if I had the opportunity to speak uh, to a modern audience, I would certainly say uh, that uh, it is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. You should be uh, teaching your children how to read and write, sending them to school, making sure that when they are reading, you know, they're reading, and you're not trying to teach them what to think, but how to think. And so to give them the opportunity to read uh, two sides of an argument and make up their own intelligent mind. To articulate uh, their uh, satisfaction or disdain for what they see in the society. This is what we hope our children can do. And if we train, if we train them well uh, when they're young, uh, then they won't be... Uh, docile and cowardly when they're adults. They will stand up to injustice wherever it might uh, pre present itself uh, in this country. And so uh, it's uh, always uh, awkward to be uh, naming or creating a list of those uh, people who deserve credit, and many do, and 
there are too many to name. And of course, uh, uh, my time is limited uh, and the modern audience, your attention span is somewhat limited. I understand uh, that you have important things to do. Uh, but uh, what I'm, uh, I hope, hopefully today, what I've done is uh, spoke to you and gave you an idea about all those uh, in the suffrage movement and the abolition of slavery uh, that exhibited uh, great talent, uh, great reasoning, and the ability to articulate uh, uh, their passion uh, for this country uh, and uh, equal rights uh, to uh, change the minds and hearts of not only citizens but politicians as well. Uh, this is important uh, for our country and our Constitution. Uh, it's not a dead letter. This uh, Constitution that I carry in my pocket, uh, which of course was written by our four uh, founding fathers uh, and uh, so greatly uh, gives an idea uh, of a great democracy and a more perfect union, uh, but it's not a perfect letter. Uh, and it is up to us, as we did uh, after uh, emancipation, uh, to add to uh, this letter, to write uh, paragraphs, uh, amendments, the 13th Amendment, 14th and 15th Amendment. And hopefully uh, the women of the modern era have added another amendment to guarantee the woman's right to vote. This is how we... Uh, in this country, uh, make change uh, through our protests, through the First Amendment, our, our guaranteed right uh, to stage protests, either in writing or in the public square, uh, making a speech. So, uh, again, congratulations and a happy anniversary uh, of uh, this uh, convention days that we celebrate every year. Uh, in Seneca Falls, uh, which took place, of course, in July of 1848. Uh, we hope that you will come and visit uh, Seneca Falls and stand on the ground where, where so many of us uh, took a stand for woman's suffrage. And we hope that you will uh, uh, make, bring your children uh, so that they will see and understand uh, how this country um, continues to strive for a more perfect union. Thank you. I am yours truly, Frederick Douglass.